Welcome everybody to the seventh and last conversation in this series about human brains produced by Fondazione Prada. Today's conversation will explore the theme of consciousness through the history of modern philosophy. The session will feature the philosophers Massimo Cacciari and Michele Di Francesco, who will guide us through the history, exploring the thoughts and theories presented by key figures such as Plato, Descartes and Spinoza that crucially shaped the evolution of Western thinking in relation to science and particularly ideas about the nature of consciousness. Let me briefly introduce tonight's speakers then. Philosopher Massimo Cacciari is a member of the scientific board of the Human Brains Project, collaborating with Fondazione Prada to shape this three year long multidisciplinary project all about neuroscience and related disciplines. Formerly a professor in artistic literature and then aesthetics at the University of Architecture of Venice, Massimo became director of the Department of Philosophy at the Academy of Architecture of Lugano from 1998 to 2005. In 2002, with Father Luigi Verze, he co-founded the Department of Philosophy at the Vita Salute San Raffaele University in Milan, where he was appointed the first dean and where he is currently Professor Emeritus in philosophy. Massimo Cacciari has taught and presented at conferences in many universities and other institutions throughout Europe. He's been the recipient of many prestigious awards, such as the Hannah Arendt Award for Political Philosophy in 1999, and the gold medal Pio Manzu from the President of the Italian Republic in 2008. And he has received several honorary degrees as well from the University of Genoa, Bucharest and Bologna. Professor Cacciari has been awarded the honorary citizenship of Sarajevo for his political and cultural action during the war and siege on that city, and of Syracuse for his work on Plato and Neoplatonism. His recent publications include The Unpolitical, published by Yale University Press in 2009, Generating God in 2017, and The Restless Mind in 2019. Michele Di Francesco is Professor of Logic and Philosophy of Science at the School for Advanced Studies IUSS, Pavia. He is an associate member of the Institute Jean Nicot in Paris, a past Chancellor of the IUSS and a past Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy of the Vita Salute San Raffaele University in Milan. Di Francesco is the President of the Italian Society of Neuroethics and the Philosophy of Neuroscience and a past president of the European Society for Analytic Philosophy and of the Italian Society for Analytic Philosophy. He is the author of 11 books and about 100 scientific articles and book chapters. His most recent books are The Self and Its Defences, published by Paul Grave Macmillan in 2016, and Philosophy of Mind, Body, Consciousness, Thinking in 2017. Professor Di Francesco's main focus of research is the philosophy of mind and cognitive science, and in particular, the philosophical problems of subjective experience, how we all experience the world and ourselves. He likes to explore nothing less than the nature of the self and the place of consciousness in the natural order. So having introduced tonight's speakers, I would like to invite them to take the floor and to begin their conversation, to begin their talks to us tonight, starting with Professor Cacciari, over to you. Thank you, Professor, and good evening, everyone. I will give a very simple introduction, and I will just touch upon few of the authors that marked the research, philosophical research, on the themes and subjects that we discuss uh, today and about the, this research and the new approaches, I think that my colleague, Professor Di Francesco, will talk more extensively than me. And I think that we still have like a kind of legend still going on around the philosophical thinking. 
a kind of legend that is nourished by a kind of bad philosophy in the framework of which the metaphysics and this very important word that isn't very much understood by some in the significance and meaning of the words metaphysics that Aristotle had. Well, so some consider the philosophical thinking as a way to separate or distance itself radically from the biological foundations, the body aspects of our being and the noetic, noethical dimension. And even a great philosopher like Nietzsche, who talked about body as reason, as a great reason, the body is a great reason, in other uh, pages writes about the fact that philosophers has have in their story a, a disliked and despised the bodily dimension, creating a contrast between the body, bodily dimension and the spirit. And this is a completely false vision. There's no philosophy that can be uh, called philosophy that is dualistic. Plato in one of the Carmide, one of his beautiful pages, but I could find so many other wonderful pages by Plato said, Plato said, we cannot believe that we can take care of a part of our body without understanding them, them as a whole. And he also adds, we cannot take care or care se separately for the parts of the body of which kephare, this is the term in Greek he used, he used is an essential part. Kephare is been has been translated as the mind, but I'm not, I don't agree. Uh, kephare is the chief, but it's in the, the brain, the head, the head. And in this case, the head is a word for the brain. So this is what Plato is trying to say. Uh, brain is the fundamental, essential part we have to take care of as a part of the body, as the head of uh, the body, kefale. And so in our body, in the body, of the body, belonging to the body, matter as the body is a thinking matter. And the idea of a thinking matter is something that we can find originally in the history and the tradition of our uh, thinking, the Western uh, thinking. We could also show how this fundamental direction is something that we can find in our civilization and not in other civilizations, but it is part of our thinking, Western thinking, as we've seen in Plato and in Plato in, and how in how other uh, people misunderstood the metaphysics of Plato. Metaphysics doesn't mean beyond nature metaphysics. It means the understanding of those principles that allow us to understand nature and our nature and our thinking nature, that thinking matter that we have that is called kefale in Plato's words, the head meaning by head, the brain, so let's say the head brain. So this idea of the uh, thinking matter comes back in extraordinary ways in another uh, philosopher, an 
a great researcher, scientific researcher, who is Leibniz, Leibniz, a great mathematician. And I would like to quote one of his pages. I could find so many interesting quotations by him, but it's, I think, extraordinarily effective for us, also from a literature point of view. He said, and I quote, is it no clear we are at the end of the 17th century. Is it not clear that every being has a certain degree of spontaneity or freedom? There are innum innumerable minds everywhere. There are minds even in the human place before conception. And unless one is foolish enough to believe that in all of nature only our minds are active. So we have Plotino, some centuries before him, said nothing is as foolish as thinking to consider every element of nature apsikos without psyche, without soul, without mind, even a small grain of sand has a certain level of spontaneity or freedom. Everything, as Spinoza said, everything is always a cause, is always also a cause. And also from an etymological point of view, in Italian, cause, causa are very, very similar words. So the idea of a thinking matter, yes, a thinking matter. Our brain is kefale, thinking matter. And so the, the thinking, as Professor Di Francesco will, I think, agree with me, so the, if every being, each being, is in a way or another a thinking matter, but this characteristic for evident reasons gets to our being at that knowledgeable level without leaving behind that being a thinking matter, that link between the bodily reason and the consciousness dimension and the, in, in, the intelligence. So if it is so, it is evident that the thinking cannot be understood as a separate activity, cogitare, thinking, and to think. What does it mean? It means that several layers of our being co agitano, co. So they think, but at the same time, uh, they uh, shake, they waggle uh, together when we think. And here we get to Descartes. When I say thinking, I do not only mean intelligere, the fact of wanting or imagining, but also feeling. So feeling is, in, for me, the same thing, thing as thinking, as cogitare in Latin, uh, cogitate. So uh, it cannot be a separate thing from thinking and from feeling. So the two things uh, are, are not separate. So we can see that this direction of the great uh, phil philosophical thinking in Europe, and especially talking about the founders of uh, modern philosophy, who were also great researchers, uh, like Descartes and Leibniz, and all the others were great scientists. So we find in all of our history the same perspective, the one of the fact that the biological foundation or 
neural or neural foundation and the consciousness cannot be separate. So the inseparability of these two elements, consciousness, stems from feeling from the unconscious. And they get together, they collide, they can enter into a conflict, as many know, know very well. But these two dimensions are not separate. They cannot be separate, with the exception of some pathological situation. So what is the problem here? The problem is that this is something that the poet Leopardi uh, questioned and questioned himself about. Yes, it's true that the brain is the one thinking that there's an equivalence between mind and brain. So who can think if not the brain? Who could say otherwise it's impossible to state something else with reason? So the point and the problem is not this. It's, it's not the fact of understanding the relation and correlation between these elements. But the point is, and the issue is, and that's my way of thinking, and it's my personal point of view, that I cannot explain in too, too many details since I don't have enough time. But I think that the good way to, confront, to talk about this correlation is not a mechanical way in the relation between these wrinkles, these layers. So wrinkle is a term that we found in in in, in philosophy and in the history of philosophy. There's our brain, mind, consciousness that have a very in this inseparability. So even Hume talked about this very ancient way of considering these things as separate things. Why do we need to go back to a deterministic and mechanical approach that is so obsolete? For Leibniz, this wasn't, wasn't possible. But even uh, Descartes and Spinoza questioned that. So the point is, once again, that we have to understand this relation, but we cannot explain this relation in a deterministic way or on the basis of a continuum, of a simple continuity as a linear development and evolution between the unconscious dimension, feeling, and consciousness. So the gift of self as it's not very uh, an expression that I really cherish. So the is also, uh, as Dimasio said, this is something new. This is an innovation into the evolution of our species. It is absolutely a leap. Natura facit saltus. Nature just has quantum leaps. Well, we're not sure about that, but we have an evolutionistic mechanism cause and effect. Maybe this is the cause and we maybe know the effect. Well, everything cannot be that linear. This is a very archaic epistemology. epistemology. So it's not that linear. But I have to try to understand what the nexus is. Yes, I do have to try to explain that. But this explanation will be pertinent. And if we take our distance from determinism and deterministic approaches, and we distance ourselves from this superstitious idea of causality, even the great physics abandoned this uh, causality perspective. And at the same time, same time, sorry, in the Text, texts that I and the books that I read about uh, scientific philosophy, I think that we are observing the idea of 
mind and brain are the same thing, this kind of approach, and why? What does that mean? If I try to explain in terms that are not deterministic, but uh, others, probabilistic, this kind of probabilistic approach, I'm not going against a scientific approach because contemporary science is probabilistic, is statistical. Nature is intelligent, so it doesn't impose imp imposes it impose itself using a very rigid causality principle. In other terms, my idea is that the perspective, the good perspective of the research in psychological in the psychological field, is a perspective that, and I'm trying to summarize here, that familiarizes with the terms of indetermination that regulates the same calculation of mathematic, mathematics and physical, the in indetermination of principles. This is something that I find in contemporary logics and in the great uh, physics, and sometimes I don't. I don't find it in some approaches from contemporary scientific uh, psychology. So if our work goes into in this direction, I think that we can see new paths and very interesting new perspectives in the cooperation and the common work and collaboration between real philosophy. I'm talking about the real one, not the one talked about in in books and, and stories, it's the one of the authors of the great, great ones uh, and the classic. Logics, physical science and philosophy, I think that there's a common perspective that revolves around a common epistemology and this is the end of my contribution. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, um, Professor Cacciari, um, for that fascinating talk. And now it's time for me to hand over to Professor Di Francesco. Over to you, Professor Di Francesco. Thank you and good evening. It is uh, a great pleasure for me to take part to this uh, final session of the human brains uh, and with uh, these conversations. Uh, it has been a, a pleasure also to follow my colleague Massimo Cacciari. As he was saying, I'm going to focus a bit more on uh, contemporary discussion, but I also would like to uh, start at least from Descartes, because indeed, uh, we're speaking about a personality, a person who can act as a liaison for issues related to classical philosophic ideas and also modern philosophical ideas. Uh, Professor Cacciari was uh, reminding us uh, the innovation presented by Descartes when he spoke about the mind. Uh, so it was not, not the cogitatio, not just the intellect, uh, but there was also the sensitivity, which also had a role. So uh, a philosopher of uh, cognitive science, uh, of contemporary uh, cognitive science, uh, has defined human beings uh, as uh, infermisferous, uh, meaning that we nourish ourselves with uh, information, but at the same time, we have feelings. Uh, and uh, we perceive the subjective feelings. So Descartes uh, so stated, who am I? I'm a, a thinking being, and what is this? Uh, someone who has doubt, uh, someone who denies, uh, someone who maybe wants, who does not want, someone who imagines, someone who thinks. And that was a revolution. And uh, it was also a definition similar to what uh, we mean by conscience uh, to a broader level. So this uh, new uh, sense of uh, feeling uh, of uh, not just having uh, a physical experience uh, of our life, uh, but uh, a physical component uh, 
which intersects itself also with the intellect, uh, with uh, desire, and with many other issues, well, this uh, was indeed something fundamental. There is another issue on which I want to dwell. And this is how Descartes uh, uh, always, uh, you know, whenever uh, people spoke about him, he was the one who defended uh, uh, a dualism, uh, an approximate uh, dualism. And, and, and this surprises me. I'm not an historian of philosophy. I'm not a, a scholar, as uh, Professor Kachari is, of uh, the ideas of the past. But just to read, you know, uh, metaphysical meditations, you see sentences such as, now there is nothing that nature can teach to me more explicitly than the fact that I have a body. Well, this is something that should make us think. Because via uh, these uh, sensations of thirst, of hunger, nature is telling me that uh, I'm not just like, you know, a Norseman or a captain of a ship, uh, reminding us of Aristotle, but also that uh, the two things are totally connected. Uh, they're bound one with the other. It's a single whole, in Latin, commistus, uh, a melange uh, in French, uh, so a, a mix. Uh, but the problem is to understand what this means. We're not denying, of course, that uh, uh, there weren't uh, uh, differences between the ideas of Descartes and our ideas of today. But it is important for us to, to recall these ideas. And the interesting uh, fact uh, is that in the 20th century, we saw the development of a science of the mind uh, which went in uh, a direction not so much on the side of Descartes but uh, on the side of what uh, Kachari was mentioning of the so-called thinking matter and we started to ask ourselves how could matter think and uh, it was a lucky case uh, because it, Massimo when you uh, concluded your, your lecture you touched uh, on the relationship existing between Alan Turing and the philosophy of the mind. Uh, Alan Turing is the father of uh, uh, computer science, uh, and uh, he uh, dealt with this not to invent computers, even if the computer was invented thanks to his studies, uh, but uh, because he was studying the philosophy of math, actually. And Turing showed, or rather, he showed that a series of logical processes, of logical demonstrations, could be calculated by algorithms and calculated by a mechanical machine, by the Turing machines, as they are called, what then physically will be transformed into a computer. And from here comes the idea that we can uh, try to answer to the question what the mind is. Well, the mind is a device that processes information and that processes representations of the external world. It's not the uh, dominant vision of today, but it was fundamental at the time to, to uh, get to our ideas of today. And this idea of uh, computations and representations uh, allows uh, to unify the natural world because there's no longer a reason to deny animals uh, to have uh, 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 the possibility of processing algorithms. And this is an important and fundamental element. This was called uh, cognitive science. And at the basis of cognitive science, there is exactly this. But versus cognitive uh, science, uh, some more intuitive uh, persons, uh, more intuitive uh, than others, uh, or more careful vis-a-vis -vis nuances, uh, have in fact realized that it was a problem with the notion of conscience. Because what happens uh, in the cog cognitivistic approach is that once start from the bottom with a Darwinian type of approach. Uh, hence, conscience uh, is uh, the point of arrival, not the starting point. 
So the point of arrival of a series of sub-personal processes, so below the personal experience, and these emerge at a more complex level, and they emerge sequentially until you get to the level of conscience. But the problem is that it's not clear how, with a traditional approach, this process could be completed. I quote uh, Thomas Nagel, who introduced uh, the idea based on which uh, a con state of conscience is a state uh, that uh, says, uh, which says what is it is like. These are subjective facts. He says that the fact that an organism has a conscience experience uh, fundamentally means uh, that it, uh, it, it, it perceives a special effect in being that specific organism. So this uh, subjective experience uh, was not grasped by anyone in the uh, familiar sort of say, assessment of what is mental, because these were all logically compatible with uh, its uh, absence. It cannot be analyzed uh, in by uh, logical functional states or by intentional states uh, because these could be attributed to a, a robot or to an automaton uh, who behave uh, like uh, persons even if they do not gain any real experience uh, well this author who wrote in 1974 he wrote an essay titled Che fetto fa what is it like to be a bat so he uh, clarified uh, that it was important to ask ourselves what uh, uh, conscience is uh, in species different than ours. And this uh, problem was uh, tackled early on, but uh, many years were necessary before this was uh, clarified, or at least it became uh, clearer. And what happened is that in the between the 80s and 90s, uh, some theories uh, came out, uh, theories of conscience uh, based uh, on uh, uh, brain analysis. Uh, some expressions came out. Jean-Pierre Changer spoke about neuronal man, <coughs> Patricia Churchland uh, of neurophilosophy. So they set at the center what we have learned, thanks to technological development, and what we've learned from the functioning of the brain that was uh, you know, tackled uh, during these many meetings. But we still have the problem of the fact that, from a certain point of view, the presence of conscience uh, seems not uh, to be totally compatible with the mechanicistic type of uh, physical science, uh, as uh, Professor Kachari mentioned. So what becomes important is to see how we can tackle such things. I think that time, my time is up. I simply want to quote the existence of different approaches that are materialistic traditional approaches we have uh, dualistic approaches. And then recently, uh, what is interesting is that we have gone back uh, to a position which up to a few years ago uh, was unknown, meaning the so-called pamsikism, meaning that this derives uh, not from the Renaissance, uh, not from Plotinus, uh, but it comes uh, from the analysis of contemporary physics. Uh, one of the most surprising aspects of contemporary physics, uh, it is not answer to the question, what does physics uh, talk about? Contemporary physics, according to many authors, uh, describes uh, the relationship existing between the fundamental objects of physics. But it does not, uh, you know, an does not analyze its nature. And some authors, um, generating, of course, a lot of discussion in doing so, and this has raised interest, uh, but Floth, for example, uh, defends these positions. He wrote uh, uh, an interesting uh, book, uh, 
a bit complicated to uh, accept in full, but he defends this panpsychist of Caesar called the, uh, Galileo's error, but the uh, mechanicistic type of Galileo's. So from this viewpoint, uh, we can say that uh, what we are witnessing today is that there is a return of, uh, uh, of uh, an interest uh, uh, in conscience uh, by philosophers of the mind, uh, and this for an interest on uh, phenomenology, as well as uh, for this, uh, the importance of this uh, uh, bodily disembodiment uh, or incarnation, this embodiment uh, uh, which uh, defines uh, our, our cognitive processes, a fusion between the bodily nature and uh, our cognitive uh, uh, processes. And also, this has been uh, just a comment that I wanted to make. I just changed a bit my, my lecture because I wanted to touch on some of the points mentioned by Professor Cacciari. And I do hope uh, that uh, uh, this has been of some interest to you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Di Francesco and, and Professor Cacciari as well. Absolutely fascinating, and I think what a wonderful way to end our series on human brains conversations. Over the course of the series, we've heard from many different scientists and philosophers working in different disciplines. And I think what you've done this evening is, is really shown us um, the, the history of that, of that thought, the way that ideas have evolved through time, and you've really put um, our modern ideas about, about the, the brain and the mind and human consciousness in context. So thank you very much indeed for doing that. Really wonderful talks this evening. Thank you everybody who's joined us live this evening. The recording of this last conversation will become part of the archive of the Fondazione Prada Human Brains Conversation Project and will be available on the website and on the YouTube channel as well. And you can also find the recorded lectures from the earlier six sessions covering a range of very diverse subjects. Syntax, a, a discussion between Angela Federici and Robert Berwick. Uh, lateralization in the brain we heard about with Guido Genotti and Paolo Bartolomeo. Bilingualism with Ellen Bialystok and Jason Rothman. We looked at music and language with Stephen Mythen and Stefan Kolsch. Neural plasticity, um, held by Jeffrey Klein and Alvaro Pasqualione, and biological evolution with Simona Ginsberg and Eva Yablonka. So you can find all of those conversations um, on the website as well and on the YouTube channel if you want to dip your toe a little further into the science and philosophy of human brains. Now, this three year long multidisciplinary human brains project is all about placing science in its wider cu cultural context and finding new ways to share the very latest in brain science and the very latest in philosophy as well. The programme was developed by Fondazione Prada, guided by a scientific board chaired by the neurologist Giancarlo Comi and including cognitive neurologist Yubin Abutalebi. Uh, the philosopher and speaker for tonight's conversation, Massimo Cacciari, so he's been helping uh, to guide this entire project. Uh, the scientific journalist Viviana Kassam, the curator Udo Kittelman, uh, the neurologist and neurophysiologist Letizia Liorani, uh, sorry, Liocani, uh, neurolinguist Andrea Moro, and cognitive neurologist Daniela Parani. As we close this last conversation, we would like to thank all of those scientists, scientists who have joined us for this astonishing project. But as one chapter of the Human Brains Project draws to a close, another is taking shape. And this will take the form of an exhibition which takes place in Fondazione Prada's venue, Cacorna del Reg Regina, a palace on the Grand Canal in Venice. The show will open shortly on the 23rd of April, and it's running until the 27th of November during the same months as the Venice Art Biennale. 2022. The exhibition is entitled Human Brains. It begins with an idea and the exhibition is curated by Udell Kittelman and it's the culmination of a long research project carried out along with Fondazione Prada's curators, 
and the scientific board. The aim of the project is to explore what lies at the very root of human experience, the inseparable nature, as we've heard so brilliantly this evening, of brain and mind, leading the audience to discover the secrets of thought and the extreme complexity of the organ that generates our thoughts and emotions. The exhibition will take us on a historical journey through the human brain and the history of thought from prehistory to the present day. And in parallel, we'll delve into the complex neural architecture inside our heads that underlies the immense richness of human cognition. The project Human Brains, It Begins With An Idea, includes contributions from 32 international fiction writers and 36 neuroscientists and philosophers across five continents. Open questions, current hypotheses and ethical and technological considerations will be considered alongside sharing recent revelations. The exhibition ranges across all of these different subjects, neurobiology, neurochemistry, philosophy, psychology, linguistics, artificial intelligence and robotics, and the history of science and medicine. And I do hope that you'll have the chance to visit that wonderful exhibition in Venice. Thank you again to everyone who's joined us live today and to those of you who've also joined us and been with us on the whole journey um, looking at these um, looking at using these conversations to look at human brains. From me, Professor Alice Roberts, from our distinguished guests, Professor Massimo Cacciari and Professor Michele Di Francesco, and from everyone at Fondazione Prada, goodbye. Keep well and stay curious.